All of a sudden, computer vision is solved. All of a sudden, speech recognition is solved. All of a sudden, language understanding is solved. These incredible problems associated with intelligence, one by one by one by one, where we had no solutions for in the past, desperate desire to have solutions for, all of a sudden, one after another gets solved You know, every couple of years. It's incredible. Yeah, so you're seeing that in 2012. You're looking ahead and, and believing that that's the future that you're going to be living in now. And you're making bets that get you there, really big bets that have very high stakes. Mm -hmm. And then my perception as a layperson is that it takes a pretty long time to get there. You make these bets. Eight years, eight, uh, 10 years. So yeah. my question is, if Alex, that happened in 2012, and this audience is probably seeing and hearing so much more about AI and NVIDIA ten specifically years 10 years later, mm -hmm. why did it take a decade? Mm -hmm. And also, because you had placed those bets, mm -hmm. what did the middle of that decade feel like for you? Well, that's a good question. It probably felt like today, you know, to me, to me, there's always some problem and then there's, there's some reason to be to be impatient. There's always some reason to be uh, happy about where you are. And, and there's always many reasons to carry on. And so, so I, I think as I was reflecting a second ago, that sounds like this morning. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but I would say that in all things that we pursue, first, you have to have core beliefs. You have to reason from, from your best principles. Um, and ideally, you're reasoning from it from principles of either physics or uh, deep understanding of of, uh, of the industry or deep understanding of the science, wherever you're reasoning from. Um, you reason from first principles, and at some point, you have to believe something. And if those principles don't change and the assumptions don't change, uh, then you there's no reason to change your core beliefs. And then along the way, there's always some... Uh, evidence of of um you know of success and and that you're you're leading in the right direction and sometimes you know you, you go a long time without evidence of success and you, you might have to course correct a little but um the evidence comes and and if you feel like you're going in the right direction we just keep on going the question of why did we stay so committed for so long the answer is actually the opposite there was no reason to not be committed because we are we believed it and and um, I, I've believed in Nvidia for thirty plus years, and and I'm still here working every single day. And uh, there's no fundamental reason for me to change my belief system. And um, uh, I fundamentally believe that the, the work we're doing in revolutionizing computing is as true today, even more true today than it was before. And and um, uh, and so we'll we'll stick with it, you know, until until otherwise. Um, th there's of course very difficult times along the way you know when you're investing in something and nobody else believes in it and costs a lot of money and uh you know maybe investors or or others would rather you just keep the profit or you know whatever it is improve the share price or whatever it is um, but you have to believe in your future you have to invest in yourself and and um uh, we believe this so deeply uh that that we we invested you know tens of billions of dollars uh, before before it really happened, and um, uh, yeah, it was it was ten long years, but it was it was it was fun along the way. How would you summarize those core beliefs? What is it that you believe about the way computers should work, and what they can do for us that keeps you not only coming through that decade, but also doing what you're doing now, making bets? I'm sure you're making for the next few decades. The first core belief uh, w was our first discussion was about accelerated computing, parallel computing versus versus general purpose computing. We would add uh, two of those processors together and we would do accelerated computing. And I continue to believe that today. Uh, the second was was the recognition that these deep learning networks, these DNNs that came to the public during 2012, these deep neural networks have the ability to learn patterns and relationships from a whole bunch of different types of data and that it can learn more and more uh, nuanced features if it could be larger and larger. And it's easier to make them larger and larger to make them deeper and deeper um, or wider and wider. And so the scalability of the architecture is is um, 
uh, empirically true. Uh, the uh, the fact that model size and the data size being larger and larger, you can learn more knowledge uh, is also true, uh, empirically true. And so uh, if that's the case, uh, you could, you know, what what are the limits? There's not, unless there's a physical limit or an architectural limit or a mathematical limit, and it was never found, and so we believe that you could scale it, then the question, the only other question is, what can you learn from data? What can you learn from experience? Data is basically digital versions of human experience. And so what can you learn? Uh, you obviously can learn object recognition from images. You can learn speech from just listening to sound. You can learn uh, even languages and vocabulary and syntax and grammar and all just by studying a whole bunch of letters and words. So we've now demonstrated that AI or deep learning has the ability to learn almost any modality of data and it can translate to any modality of data. And so what does that mean? You can go from text to text, right? Summarize a paragraph. You can go from text to text, translate from language to language. You can go from text to images, that's image generation. You can go from images to text, that's captioning. You can even go from amino acid sequences to protein structures. In the future, uh, you'll go from protein to words. What does this protein do? Or um, give me an example of a protein that has these properties, you know, uh, identifying a drug target. Um, and so you could just see that all of these problems are around the corner to be solved. Uh, you can go from words to video. Why can't you go from words to action tokens for a robot? Mm -hmm. You know, from the computer's perspective, how is it any different? And so it, it opened up this universe of opportunities and universe of problems that we can go solve. And um, uh, that, that, that gets us quite excited. It feels like we are on the cusp of this truly enormous change. When I think about the next 10 years, I, unlike the last 10 years, I know we've gone through a lot of change already, but I don't think I can predict anymore how I will be using the technology that is currently being developed. That's exactly right. I think the last 10, the reason why you, you feel that way is the last 10 years was really about the science of AI. The next 10 years, we're going to have plenty of science of AI, but the next 10 years is going to be the application science of AI, the fundamental science versus the application science. And so the, the applied research, the application side of AI now becomes, how can I apply AI to digital biology? How can I apply AI to climate technology? How can I apply AI to agriculture, the fishery, to robotics, to transportation, um, optimizing logistics? How can I apply AI to, you know, teaching? How do I apply AI to, you know, podcasting, right? And so. I'd love to choose a couple of those to help people see how this fundamental change in computing that we've been talking about is actually going to change their experience of their lives, how they're actually going to use technology that is based on everything we just talked about. One of the things that I've now heard you talk a lot about and I have a particular interest in is physical AI, or in other words, robots. My friends. Meaning humanoid robots, but also robots like self-driving cars and smart buildings or autonomous warehouses, or autonomous lawnmowers or more. From what I understand, we might be about to see a huge leap in what all of these robots are capable of because we're changing how we train them. Up until recently, you've either had to train your robot in the real world where it could get damaged or wear down, or you could get data from fairly limited sources like humans in motion capture suits. But that means that robots aren't getting as many examples as they'd need to learn more quickly. But now, we're starting to train robots in digital worlds, which means way more repetitions a day, way more conditions, learning way faster. So we could be in a big bang moment for robots right now. And NVIDIA is building tools to make that happen. You have Omniverse, and my understanding is this is 3D worlds that help train robotic systems so that they don't need to train in the physical world that's exactly right. You just announced Cosmos, which is ways to make that 3D universe 
much more realistic. So you can get all kinds of different, um, if we're training something on this table, many different kinds of lighting on the table, many different times of day, many different, you know, experiences for the robot to go through so that it can get even more out of Omniverse. As a kid who grew up loving data on Star Trek, Isaac Asimov's books, and just dreaming about a future with robots, how do we get from the robots that we have now to the future world that you see of mm -hmm. robotics? Yeah. Let me use um, language models, maybe ChatGPT, as a reference for understanding um, Omniverse and Cosmos. And so, so first of all, when ChatGPT first came out, it, it was, it was um, uh, extraordinary. And it has the ability to do, uh, to basically, uh, from your prompt, uh, generate text. However, as amazing as it was, it has um, the tendency to hallucinate uh, if it goes on too long or if uh, it pontificates about a topic it you know, is not informed about, it'll still do a good job generating plausible answers. Um, it just wasn't grounded in the truth. And so, so um, uh, people, people uh, call it hallucination. And so the, the next generation, uh, shortly, it, was, it had the ability to be conditioned by um, context, so you could upload your PDF, and now it's grounded by the PDF. The PDF becomes the ground truth. It could be. It could actually look up search, and then the search becomes uh, its ground truth. And between that, it could reason about uh, what is how to produce the answer that you're asking for. And so, so the first part is a generative AI, and the second part is ground truth. Okay. And so now let's come into the the the, the physical world, uh, the world model. We need a foundation model, just like we need Chat, Chat GPT had a core foundation model. That was the breakthrough. In order for robotics to, to be smart about the physical world, it has to understand things like gravity, friction, inertia, um, geometric and spatial awareness. It has to uh, understand that an object is sitting there even when I looked away. When I come back, it's still sitting there, object permanence. Um, it has to understand cause and effect. If I tip it, it'll fall over. Um, and so, so these kind of physical common sense, if you will, has to be captured or encoded into a world foundation model so that the AI has world common sense, okay? And so, so we have to go, somebody has to go create that, and that's what we did with Cosmos. We created a world language model. Just like ChatGPT was a language model, this is a world model. The second thing we have to go do is we have to do the same thing that we did with PDFs and context and um, grounding it with ground truth. And so the way we augment Cosmos with ground truth is with physical simulations. Because Omniverse uses physics simulation, which is based on principled solvers. The, the mathematics is Newtonian physics. It's the, right, it's the math we know. Okay, all of the... The fundamental laws of physics uh, we've understood for a very long time, and it's encoded into, captured into Omniverse. That's why Omniverse is a simulator. And using the simulator to ground or to condition cosmos, we can now generate an infinite number of stories of the future, and they're grounded on physical truth. Just like between PDF or search, plus ChatGPT, we can generate an infinite amount of interesting things, answer a whole bunch of interesting questions. The combination of Omniverse plus Cosmos, you could do that for the physical world. So to illustrate this for the audience, if you had a robot in a factory and you wanted to make it learn every route that it could take, instead of manually going through all of those routes, which could take days and could be a lot of wear and tear on the robot, we're now able to simulate all of them digitally in a fraction of the time. And in many different situations that the robot might face, it's dark, it's blocked, it's etc. So the robot is now learning much, much faster. It seems to me like the future might look very different than today. If you play this out 10 years, mm -hmm. how do you see people actually interacting with this technology in the near future? 